Thanks, you all, for coming. This is uh, Closure in Real Life. Um, my name is Rick Hall. I'm a uh, developer at RentPath. We do, you know, apartment guide, rent.com, things like that. I get to work in Closure full time. Um, I'm also the organizer of the Atlanta Closure Meetup. Um, so we have a meeting next next week on Tuesday if you're in the area, and that's uh, that's how to reach me. Um, so the the premise of this talk is that you know I'm guessing that the fact that you're here you've at least heard the word closure before, and when people encounter it they tend to hear or the the things that tend to grab their attention the most. Um, are things that you don't necessarily work with day to day as an application developer. And so I wanted to give a feel for, you know, what, what is it that, that you're actually working with day to day? Because sure, I mean, macros can do wonderful things, but, you know, as, like I say, on a day to day basis, I just don't write them. Um, and so I want to, you know, talk about the, the good points and, and some of the bad points as well. Um, the talk's going to be, you know, a few slides um, and then some some live coding. Uh, I made slides for the whole talk, and they'll be available on GitHub, but uh, for parts of the talk, I'm not going to refer to them. So uh, Clojure, I mean, first and foremost, is a, a functional programming language that runs on the Java virtual machine. Um, it's in the Lisp style, which... Um, <laughs> You know, if, if you haven't worked with a Lisp before, it can be frightening. Really, all it amounts to is the fact that the function you're calling goes inside the parentheses instead of outside. Um, you know, the, the, the rest of the differences really amount to functional programming, which is that you're creating functions and you're uh, doing things immutably. You're, you, you generally, you don't use variables. It's just you talk about values. Um, as I said, the, the default implementation of Clojure is hosted on the uh, JVM. Uh, there's another version that compiles to JavaScript. It's called ClojureScript, and uh, that's pretty stable. We use that at RentPath as well. Um, there's also a, a CLR, you know, .NET implementation, which has existed right from the start, but for a long time has just been maintained by uh, one person. Um, but it's starting to get a lot more attention lately because some people have uh, put together a project that uses the Unity game development engine, and so they're writing 3D games with a closure REPL, which sounds pretty neat. And again, immutability is, is key. That's, uh, but what, you know, from the outside, people, the first time you t hear about closure, uh, or, or Lisps in general, you, you tend to hear about people bragging about Lisp macros, and they have these mythological powers. Um, and then what draws people to functional programming languages in general uh, is the support for concurrency. You know, if, uh, if you're not mutating any variables, you don't have race conditions. And so that's pretty nice. And then another thing people have been exposed to is just kind of the, the closure philosophy. Uh, particularly in talks by Rich Hickey, who's the, the developer of Clojure. And I'll mention a couple of his talks here today. Um, so, you know, the, uh, the, the essay that did it for me in terms of uh, getting me to check out Lisp was called Beating the Averages by Paul Graham. Uh, he talks about his startup via web where they built, you know, an online, uh, an application that let you build online stores back in the 90s. Uh, that ended up getting bought by Yahoo and being Yahoo storefront. And if you read the article, he talks about their fast development cycles. He talks about the different power of different programming languages. And, you know, if you're using a less powerful language, you don't understand why these other languages are more powerful. But if you're using a powerful one, you look down on those other peoples and say, you know, how can you do anything? And in his case, how can you do anything without macros? Um, in practice, you know, well, okay, I, I did want to talk about, you know, what, what macros are. And the idea is that in Lisp, all of your programs are written as a list data structure with the first element being the function you're calling and subsequent arguments, um, sub subsequent elements being the arguments. And because your code is data and functions transform data, 
macros are just functions that run at compile time and instead of taking data they take your program itself as data um, you know the the word macro and also meta programming in general exists in other languages like you might remember uh, C macros which were basically processor instructions for manipulating the text of a program um, and so, some other other languages have features for metaprogramming but they're generally text-based and they're generally using a custom syntax that that's different from the rest of the language whereas in list macros and in closure macros you're actually doing closure programming to modify the actual structure of the program and so it does it does give you a bit more power but in practice you know the the key thing is higher order functions the the fact that you can write a little code and have it applied in lots of different places and you know lots of functional languages have that um, so I mean I, I highly recommend functional programming I personally I love working in closure but you know the the, the promise of, of Lisp macros that you're going to have programs writing programs, you know, I was like, all right, cool, I'll kick that off and just go to the beach, but uh, it hasn't worked yet. Um, and then you'll see if you, if you look at text on Common Lisp, they have a bunch of different macros that, they, you know, it's like, well, you can do this and you can do that. And, uh, you know, the people who work on Clojure say, yeah, that's a good idea, so we already have it. Um, the other, the other thing, you know, because people are drawn to functional programming because of concurrency and multi-core specifically, um, the fact that the closure has some unique features in dealing with, um, with multi-core and uh, concurrency, that gets a lot of, a lot of attention as well. Uh, Rich Hickey did a talk, I believe at Strange Loop a couple of years ago, called Are We There Yet? where his kind of, he, he's the creator of closure and his kind of philosophy, he's always finding things that are two ideas combined together. You might not even notice that they're two different ideas and he pulls them apart. And uh, he really looks at the difference between the identity of a variable and the state between, you know, the value it has. And by, by separating those two concepts, he created several different data structures that handle mutation in specific ways. Um, you know, the, the one that gets the most attention is software transactional memory. Think about transactions that operate, you know, in a database, um, but you can basically define different data types that must be modified inside of a transaction so you can synchronize changes. Um, you know, the, another data type, the one I use the most when I do have to mutate stuff is, uh, atoms which do compare and swap that basically you're just making sure that nobody has changed a value out from under you and so you're actually making the change that that you think you're making um, there are also another data type called agents for doing asynchronous changes i've never actually seen them used in practice um, i'm sure they they have their uses um, but you know in in practice that what makes a big difference for doing concurrency is putting your state, just isolating it in specific places that you, most of your program doesn't change. It takes inputs and it returns outputs. And then you just have the stuff that changes in one, you know, in, in small isolated places. And then you just watch those places. Um, you know, compare and swaps and software transactional memory probably add a little bit to it. And I'm sure there are times where you reach for it and you're like, thank God it's there. I haven't run into those use cases and maybe it's just because it's there, I don't have to think about it. I don't know. Um, the other big win for um, um, concurrency and closure is this library called Core Async, which came out in uh, 2013. And it gives a, a, it's a library that gives a Go style programming feel where you're using channels uh, and blocks of code called Go blocks that uh, send messages back and forth between between processes, and uh, hopefully I, we'll have time to get into a, a demo of that later because it's uh, it's pretty neat stuff. Um, you know the probably the the 
philosophy is best summed up in uh, Rich Hickey's talk, Simple Made Easy. I'm not sure where he gave that, but Google helps. Um, you know, the, the, the overlying idea behind closure is making everything as simple as you can, to, to take apart ideas that are conflated together and uh, separate them apart. Um, kind of, I promised myself when I was giving this talk I wasn't going to use any special closure words because closure developers, we've all watched the same talks and we've kind of developed a, a vocabulary and it's almost like inside jokes that you say the first line and everybody knows the rest. And so I'm not going to talk about data being complected, but uh, other people will and I'm just going to warn you. Um, and the other thing I should say is that uh, whenever, whenever a choice had to be made, generally the, cho the choice goes for pragmatism. I don't know if I have any actual examples of that in this talk, but it's there. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, here, here are a list of the, the features I'm going to talk about, the things that you actually interact with day to day and make Clojure a language that, that I really enjoy working with. Um, the first several uh, I'm going to demonstrate uh, with code samples. Um, the interop, it's, interop gets ugly, I don't care. I mean, you know, all the best examples use Swing, and it's, it's much nicer to use Swing from Clojure, but it's still not very nice. Um, uh, Clojure script, again, I'm going to talk about. I don't have it set up, and then I'm going to talk about the fact the cool thing about macros isn't the stuff it lets you write as much as it's the stuff that it lets other people in the community write, and, and we'll talk about that. And then uh, hopefully we'll have some time for um, uh, to go into core async and, and possibly beyond that uh, to another concept called transducers, but they get a little scary, so maybe we won't. Um, so the first idea I wanted to talk about is... Um, the idea of REPL-driven development. So what a, what a REPL is, it stands for Read, Eval, Print Loop. And the idea is you're typing in code in an interactive environment, and it's responding to you as you type. And so let's see if I can remember. Uh, need a tick. So I'm starting a program. I'm actually starting it in a REPL just because that way I have one set up. Um, but I'm just gonna gonna let it go. And the idea is that it's supposed to print out hello, and uh, can you see that? And then world, and then it's just gonna go back every couple of seconds and say hello world, hello world, uh, which is kind of boring, but. But unfortunately, what it actually does is it prints hello twice, uh, three times, four times. So there's clearly a bug in the program. And um, so I'm going to see if I can fix it. Let's see. Okay. I'll maximize this uh, buffer in a, in a minute, but uh, I want to show the terminal as well. So, um, okay, so right now I am actually connected to this process that is running. And uh, if you can see, the, the problem I have is that uh, this this process that's running um, it's actually going in in a asynchronous uh, block here that's just you know emitting a, a signal every every four seconds um, until it gets a, uh, a stop message but what I'm doing wrong is that I'm checking to see whether the counter is equal to one and that's why it only printed world the first time what I actually want to check is if um, the modulo of the counter and two is equal to one. So I can make the change and reevaluate that form. And then hopefully this is going to start alternating the way it should. And I mean, obviously, this is a really trivial example, but the ability to 
connect to a running system, you have your whole environment set up. Um, you know, if you depend on things like database connections and you know, in, in our applications we tend to use RMQ connections. And it's nice to have that all set up and then be able to connect to it from, you know, whatever part of the, the program is giving us a problem. And uh, let's see. Forgot what I called my variable control channel. Okay, so the timer's done, and I don't need to uh, look at my console anymore. Um, so this uh, this program here was just there to demonstrate what what a REPL is. Um, the, the key thing that um, you use a lot in, uh, in Clojure are its uh, collection types. I mean, that's one of the nice things about Clojure is that you're working with data as data. It's not data as objects. You don't have to use accessors. I mean, it's just data. And a lot of people now are defining their APIs in terms of data, and it, it, it makes for a, a nice development cycle. Um, you know, and the, there are a few different collection types. I don't know if you saw David Nolan's talk uh, in, the, in the last hour uh, next door, but he w really went into a lot of the detail on the, the structure underneath the collection types, how the, um, you say, closure is immutable, so they're all immutable collections. And he really went into the, kind of the, the nuts and bolts and the why, why the structures can be immutable, why they can return a new copy of the collection um, with the new values without without hurting performance and without taking up a lot of um, a lot of memory but uh, the most uh, the most common collection types you're going to use um, are vectors which you know think like arrays or vectors really in any other language that are easy to uh, append to at the end um, And, uh, okay. So, so um, again, I do all my, my work in a REPL, um, so I can define this, uh, um, this vector V, and then I have access to it uh, down here. I can see what V is. Um, so a vector, I mean, that's a sequential order of elements, and as you would expect in a uh, functional programming language, I can do things like mapping over the vector, um, it's function, and then collection, um, and return, you know, all the elements. Um, I can filter odd elements from the vector and okay that that's great that's kind of boring um, but you know we also have collection types like uh, maps which you know it's just a some languages they're called dictionary I think in Ruby they're called hashes and the idea is it's a it's a map from keys to values um, but the keys and the values can be anything uh, we'll make that a string character like that Oop, did I miss something match delimiter oh, maybe I won't use a character there um, so the um, the type of uh, 
the 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 most often used keys in um, in closure are they're referred to as keywords. They are um, you know just a colon followed by a string. You can also namespace them so that you know a keyword A in this in this code file is different than keyword A in a, in another code file. Um, and so we can see that you know it's like okay so I have uh, keyword keyword C uh, string B and keyword A is my keys and my values are all well two of them are uh, are integers um, so if I want to take something out of this map I can take out the keyword C and so that returns me a new map that just has A and B. Um, let me give this a name just so I can get to it later. Um, but if you see the, the original map, you know, like I say, they're immutable. It still has the keyword C. Um, but again, because it's a data structure, all of the, the data structures um, override certain, they, they implement certain in, interfaces like the sequence interface so I can also map over the, the values of um, of the map. And so that's why I dissociated the uh, the, the keyword C, I created a map without it just because I didn't know what increment was going to do to a string. Probably nothing good. Um, so maps and vectors are the, the data types that you use the most often. We also have sets, and sets are just an unordered list of items that don't have duplicates. I mean, as you would expect them to be. Note that generally the, the map is also uh, unordered. There's no guarantee about the order. Um, you know, so my, uh, you know, so, okay, in this case, they happen to be in the same order that it's reverse alphabetical, but that's, that's just a coincidence. Um, uh, so I could create a, we'll just create a set as well. And the, these each, there are functions that you can use. I don't know if you can see the delimiters let me make it one bigger because uh whoa where did all my code go okay so the uh the delimiters that the different uh collections use vectors are always done with square brackets um maps are done with the uh the curly braces um sets are done with a pound symbol or a hash in front of the, the curly braces. And so we'll just do. Oh yeah, my editor, it, uh, for, for anonymous functions, it's gonna replace it with a lambda for the set. When it gets it right, it replaces the set with that. What's funny is that um, you'll comment out a form with a pound symbol as well. And so sometimes my comments turn into set notation, which is kind of weird. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so again, a set is also an unordered collection. Um, and so here you can clearly see that that is not ordered. Um, but again, sets implement the sequence uh, interface. So I can also, you know, map I guess we've been, it's been working so far, so we'll just do the same function. Um, but, uh, and, you know, if you wanted sorted elements out of a set, you could write a function that did that. Uh, I mean, you know, there is a sort function, but you could p pass the comparator you want. You can also use a sorted set, but it's going to be, you know, a little bit less efficient. Um, but what's neat about closure, closure collections is that they are themselves functions. So if I want to take the map, uh, the first map I created, and look up the element that has the, the key of B, I can get the value as two. Um, now vectors are sequential. They're essentially, they work as if they were um, maps from their index to 
their um, their item. So if I if I take a look at my vector v here and say I want the uh, well, element three, which is actually the fourth element because it's zero indexed. We get four um, sets work as, as functions as well, but I think they're kind of neat in that it'll return true or false as to whether an item is in the set. Uh, and so I use that sometimes, but I think my coworkers would rather I didn't. Um, the other thing about using keywords with the uh, the map type is that keywords themselves are functions. They are functions that know how to look themselves up in a map. So before, you know, so if I, if I do map colon A, like I said, the map is a function, it will look up the key A. But I can also do colon A1, and, or no, colon A map, and it should return one. Um, doing, uh, the, the B, which is not a keyword, will not work that way. You know, class cast exception. Because strings are not functions, whatever they may be. Um, so, talked about immutability, talked about sequences, it's talked about functions. Okay, so I guess before I move on from collections, I, I kind of went through that quick. Did anybody have any, any questions per pertaining to them or should we move on to something else? And we can do time for questions at the end too. So, okay. Um, let me see. I gotta double check on my slide what comes next. Uh, syntax kind of, let's go to polymorphism. Um, so I don't know, I haven't, I haven't really explained the syntax of the, of the closure too much. Uh, and now that I think about it, there was one more thing I wanted to show about collections. Um, and they give me a way to, to highlight some of the syntax. So I've imported into this namespace a function called prime. And so if I map whether something is prime over just a range of numbers from 0 to 10, uh, let's see, that's not going to be mini buffer not, not helpful. I'll uh, do it down here. So uh, map prime range 10. Okay, great. Um, but what if I want to create a function? Maybe uh, I want to, well, really where I want to get to is I want to create a function that does the sum of the square of primes uh, and we'll have it take a collection of some sort and so we you know if we want to let's see we're going to do the sum so um, you know functional programming you see the the map reduce pattern and there's also filter map reduce and filter are the the three big um, functional patterns that you see Reduce takes a collection and combines them using a function. So um, I'm going to take the sum. So I know I'm going to reduce uh, with the sum. Um, what am I going to reduce? I am going to uh, apply the function square, which I don't have defined. So I'll just do one in line. Um, so I'll do a function that takes an x and returns x and x. And um, let's see, I want to apply that to the uh, filter of prime numbers on whatever collection I was passed. So that is my sum of square primes function. So um, that's too long to type. I didn't have enough. So, okay, but I mean, how do you know that that's really the right value? Because do you know the sum of the primes under 10? So let's, let's get rid of one of these and we'll just do map and filter. So you can see that we get prime numbers, um, 
just call it square primes. And so, yeah, so we have two squared, three squared, five squared, seven squared, and um, you know, we can, we could, we could, uh, I should still have my vector V in scope so I could do, you know, square primes on that. And uh, so we would expect this is going to be, what, four and nine. And, oh, and 25, sure. Um, okay, so that's great. So we can get, we can get the sequence and, uh, you know, um, I like returning the sequence because then it's easy to, to reduce on top of that. Because um, there are going to be times where I'm going to want the sequence and times where I'm going to want, want the answer, you know, the, the sum. So that's great, but, you know, I really had to work from the, the outside in. It would be, uh, there, there is another syntax, and this is done with a macro. Uh, I'll go back to summing again. Um, or again, I'll take in a collection. Um, but instead of writing from the, you know, you either have to write it backwards or you write it from the outside in. Because what, what I really want to do is I want to take the collection and I want to filter the primes from that collection. And then I want to map, uh, this time I'll do the other function syntax for that, um, which is a little shorthand that's a little bit less readable, but at times uh, it's nice to have. And then and so first I'll confirm that this works. And we get the same answer, 38. So what this is saying is the, this, uh, this arrow with, with two arrowheads at the end of it, that's called the thread last macro. And what it is is you pass it in a value, and it says, okay, now take this value and insert it as the last argument um, to the next function. And then take the result of that and pass that to the next, as the last argument of the next function, which happens to be map and then take the result of map and pass that as the last argument to the reduce. And so you'll find in, in Clojure, a lot of the, the functions that operate on collections work by, you know, the, the, the collection goes as the last element to support this type of operation. You'll find a lot of other functions that, that don't work on collections, but that are related together. A lot of times um, you'll want to put the result as the first element of the, um, you know, as the, the first argument of, of a function. And again, you'll get a bunch, a stack of them. And so you just do this is called the thread first macro, which is take the result, use it as the first argument, you know, after the function call. And so, you know, that's just one of many syntactical niceties that, uh, that closure has. Um, now, oh. let's see what I want. So, in um, you know, in enclosure is a functional language. We deal with functions as opposed to Scala, which you know, even though it supports functional programming, really everything is an object and a function is actually a method on an object. Um, in, in Clojure, functions are first class. I mean, they are things um, in and of themselves and we don't, we don't deal with objects in, in Clojure. However, we can create types, we need to create types to be able to interact with, um, you know, with the Java virtual machine and, uh, you know, call into Java code or be called by Java code. Um, but polymorphism is a, is a really nice feature of object-oriented languages. But 
we try and be a little more flexible in the closure world and not necessarily have it depend on type. We have a couple of ways to do polymorphism. One is with uh, a construct called multi-methods, which allow dispatching based on any function. So for example, if I have a, a get area function and tell it that it, it takes a shape, now I can define things that will return a shape. So, well, all right, let me create, first create my different methods that are gonna be applied. So I will do a get area that operates on a circle. And so the area is going to be, um, let's see, we will take the radius and we are going to return radius times 3.14. Okay, great. Parameter and function should be a vector. There we go. Okay, so you know I can create a, a def method for for, cir for a circle. So now I just need to create something that is a circle um, and pass it in it. And so I can create. I'll just use a, a closure map, and I will give it a name of circle and a radius. of three, I need to give it a name. Okay, so now I should be able to get area of C1 and it will return, hopefully that's right. That yeah, looks right, because let's see, nine times three, uh, 27, so that's right. Um, but now I can also create a, a version that deals with a square And so even though a square is going to have a different structure, well, actually, I wanted to, when I was planning this, I wanted to do rectangle just to prove to you that it is a different structure. structure. So we'll take uh, so All right, so we'll take, we'll create a get area function that takes a rectangle. And so now I should be able to get area on a map that claims to be a rectangle. And I don't know, four and five, so this better be 20. Oh. Um, it's gonna have a base of four, and a height of five. Okay, and so now you can see in the get area function, I didn't call attention to it um, in, the, in the circle, but now that we've got both the circle and the rectangle, we can take a look at what we're passing in is a map. And so the parameter that um, we're taking as the, the first argument of this function, you know, the, the multi-method says I'm gonna accept a shape. Um, a circle says, okay, well, I know that if it's a circle, there's gonna be a keyword in there called radius. And so I can use this feature called destructuring to just say, okay, find the thing that's got a keyword of radius and put it in a variable named radius. Uh, rectangle, I say, okay, there's gonna be a base and a height, take them out of the map, give them these names, and then return them. Um, and so that's just, you know, yet another kind of pragmatic uh, simplicity that's added. Um, I can also create a def method, uh, get area, it's just the default. And just, uh, 
So I can have, I can have, well, if I spell it correctly, I can have a base case. Um, so if I try and, I don't know, get area on a triangle with a base of three and a height of five, it's, string cannot be, oh. Whatever you put first inside the parentheses is, uh, gets evaluated as a function, which once again, strings are not, so. Okay, so that, so you can, you can have a case that's going to catch all the different, um, you know, you, you, you have a default case. And so uh, in our code at RentPath, what, what we'll tend to do is, you know, in things where we're expecting a message to come in, we'll check it and see, okay, does it match this type? Great, process it this way. Does it match, you know, this structure? Uh, I say type, it's not type because it's the result of, of any value and, and here I created a, a function that just takes the name out of the shape and it dispatches based on that. Um, but when you have a match, um, you can, you can add it to the appropriate handler. And then what we do is that when we, when we don't find a match, we usually throw an exception saying, hey, I got some data I didn't understand. Um, so multi-methods are great. Um, and they give, they give a flexibility that you do not see in, um, in, you know, in most other programming languages because you have the ability to, you know, dispatch on any function that you want. Um, if you want to do one function when the first argument is this, second argument is that, and the third argument is that, you know, you can do that. You can have uh, all sorts of different behaviors and actually that's been extended with a library called core match which gives almost a, a pattern matching style structure like you'd see in other programming languages to dispatch to different functions. The downside of, of those methodologies is that they're not quite as performant as you would expect in dispatch in Java and um, so another another method of doing polymorphism of doing dispatch was created um, called protocols, which actually are based on types. And so I can create a type in enclosure. We usually use, we, we have def type, but def record, uh, also exists. And so we will create, um, I'm going to create a def record called circle again. So I can use the same example and it's just going to take a radius. And it is going to implement the area function, the area protocol. And it's going to do a get area function. And it's just going to return radius times the radius. And hopefully I got that right, and I did not. Def record circle. I don't think that. Oh, got my parameters wrong. Okay, there we go. So now I can create a circle. Uh, oh, I'm in the wrong namespace too. It's going to get a name collision. Okay, so I can create a circle. I'll just call it C1. And um, when you create when you create a data type with uh, def record or def type, you know by default it creates a constructor function which just accepts the, the arguments of the construction, uh, the constructor in order. So this time I'll do a circle of dimension two, def record circle. Oh, there's an R in circle. Hazards of live coding. Okay, so now I have my circle C1. And so if I want to call get area, on C1, 
Oh, math matters too. Uh, should just rename it square. I got to redef it. Okay, so um, and so you can imagine, and so that's doing a dispatch based on type. Uh, as you can imagine, you can also do, um, you know, do an implementation for squares and for, um, for, well, let's do square real quick. It'll be, well, again, I want to do rectangle because I want the argument count to be different. And so we're going to implement area. Cool. Okay. Thanks. So I can't be counted to spell it wrong twice in a row. Two out of three, yes, but not necessarily tight twice in a row. And so. So. Boom. There you go. Now, okay, so that's how I create um, implementations of this area protocol, which you can think of as like an interface. Uh, for these different classes, but I can also extend other classes, for example, Java classes um, to do them. So I can extend Java lang string. I don't know why I have runtime exception in my memory, but that's okay. Probably tells you something. Um, and so I'm going to say that I am going to extend area and I want the get area to return. Let's see. Shouldn't have taken this one out of my notes because I don't do this very often. Um, this, and we'll do length this. So we can decide that for whatever reason, the area of a string will just be the number of characters in it. So I can do get area of hello, should be five or not. Um, no implementation, get area. Well. I think I'd rather than try and figure out what syntax I did wrong, it's probably going to be, maybe it's a map, or it's a list, not a map. Uh, yeah, and that's, that's what I'm trying to show, because, I mean, string is a, is a final class. So let's see if that worked. Um, no, it actually, I'm, I believe it does have to be a keyword. I'll try without it. Yeah. So let me see. Google is your friend. Uh, it's going to be a little tough to read. So yeah, it should be in a map. It should be the keyword. Extend the type with the protocol. Extend the type. Yeah, did that before too. And let's see, this should be a map, not a. Uh... All right. So in theory. Yay! So yes, you can <laughs> you can extend you can extend final types in um, you know in, in closure, which 
I don't know. Can you, I, I believe you can do it in C sharp. I don't know if you can do it in in Java. Do, do you know? I, I know in C sharp you get they call them extension methods. I don't know if that does that exist in Java. Anyone know? I'll take that as a no. Um, so I wanted to, to show you the polymorphism, and so you you have, you know, you you have the choices that if you want the flexibility of being able to dispatch on any. Uh, given value that that uh, you know based on any function, you can do that with multi methods. Oh, I'm sorry, did you have a question? Yeah, is the full name of that function you define demo protocol. Yeah. So okay. So I have this uh, demo protocol get area. Let's see if we can figure out how to. Let's try. Go back to the user namespace. Okay, so we're in the user namespace. So what we want to do is we want to try uh, demo dot protocol. Um, and it's get area, and we'll try it on the string again. Okay, cool. It works. A string six? Yeah, cool. So yeah, um, the, the protocol exists within uh, the namespace where it is defined. And so the functions that, the functions that exist for the different types are also in the namespace where they're defined. As it works out, I have them de defined in the same namespace, you know, in this protocol namespace. If, however, I had set up the area protocol in a area namespace, and then I had a circle namespace, and it wanted to extend the area protocol, uh, if I were calling that, uh, it would be circle slash get area. Uh, it, yeah. Actually, I'm not sure that's true. Um, let us. Is there a good way to test this? Um, uh, like capitals. Triangle. And so we will extend area. Let's get area. This. Is going to be okay. Let me put this. That's the rebel. Okay, so I need to in the the namespace that's going to use the protocol. I need to. Uh, require, which is the closure version of of um, import. Uh, I need to require demo dot core, and I just want to pull in. Let's see if that works. Area does not exist. Wondering if I don't have something. Yeah, saved, evaluated. Ooh, hate when that does that. I'm sorry. Uh, did, yeah, it was. Thank you. Demo dot protocol. All right, so now I think I bring in the protocol name. Okay, so now, um, so I have a, a record type called triangle. Let me get into this uh, namespace. Make sure everything's evaluated. So I'll create a new triangle. 
is three and four. Okay, so if I call get area on um, T, I get not implemented because it's calling this get area. So um, Okay, so there's our answer. The um, basically in the function where in the namespace where I'm defining the the object that is implementing the protocol, um, that's where the function lives. But to do it, I need to import the protocol from where it was designed. So this class, this uh, namespace multi pulls in the basically the interface, the definition of the interface from area, from the protocol namespace, um, and then the, the get area function as applied to triangle, you know, for the, the triangle is in, uh, in this case, the multi namespace, because that's where I defined it. If I try and do uh, demo.protocol get area on a string, I don't know if it's going to work. Oh, it does work. So I'm not. I'm not quite sure how all of that is is getting resolved. Um, so let me take a break from live coding for a little bit, since it seems to have uh, gone off the rails a little bit. Um, so I wanted to show you the the polymorphism. Um, like I say, it is, it is nice. Uh, having a, a couple of ways to, you know, to, to choose just based on, you know, whether performance is key uh, or whether you, you want extra flexibility. Um, and sometimes you think about the problems differently. So again, it's, it's nice to have it. Um, Java, or I'm sorry, Clojure is designed to be a hosted language. It runs on top of the Java virtual machine and it takes full advantage of the fact that it does. Any Java library that exists, you can bring into Clojure. For the most part, things that are commonly used, people have written Clojure wrappers for, just because we tend to, you know, I showed you with the, the threading macros that we like all our parameters to line up, either as the first argument or as the last argument, just so we can chain things together. And uh, so a lot of closure libraries exist that what they do is just basically, you know, give, give names that are more in line with the, the closure convention and also uh, sort out the, the order of the arguments. Um, as I saw, we can uh, extend Java classes. You can also inherit from Java classes. Um, you can implement Java interfaces and um, I'm told that you can call Clojure from Java. I've never actually done it just because, you know, I like working in Clojure, so I like being able to use Java. But I suppose if I were in a shop that was mostly a Java shop, it might be nice, you know, for some particular libraries to, to develop them in Clojure. Um, Clojure script is a neat idea. It was introduced about four years ago. And the idea was to create a version of Clojure that compiles to JavaScript. And when it first came out, it's like, oh, well, that's nice. I like working with Clojure. I don't necessarily like working with JavaScript. Um, but at the same time, it was a little painful to use because uh, the interop is a little more complicated in JavaScript. And it just it can get kind of messy. And there was no real value proposition. I mean, nobody was going to go out of their way to use Clojure script. I mean, basically, you had to be a Clojure junkie and then say, oh, I want to try this too. Nobody was going to go out and choose this as a, as a first language or say, you know, I really want to develop uh, my client code in Clojure script. Um, but a couple changes took place. Uh, number one, like I said, core async w was created. And that is a um, 
it's a, it's a library for doing, well, as it says on the slide, asynchronous code without callbacks. You're writing asynchronous code, but you're making it look like it's done in an imperative style. You, you um, make a request for information, you know, make, make a call out to a process, and then you try and read the response. And while you're waiting for the response, the, the thread gives up execution and something else goes on. And that, you know, it's not surprising that you would have something like that in Java, which is a multi-threaded environment. Closure script or you know JavaScript they've had to work around because it's just one thread, um, and so in things like Node and and all over the place you'll see lots of callbacks. Uh, jQuery uses promises and things like that, and the, you know th those are still options, but this this is a nice other option. Uh, it's called communicating sequential processes. Uh, and I'm not quite sure how that's different from uh, functional reactive programming, but to some people there, there is a big difference. Um, and, um, but the other, the other thing that happened is, I wanna say it was about a year ago, uh, some people in the, in the ClojureScript community kind of be, became aware of a library called React.js that's uh, maintained by Facebook. I mean, they, they built that for doing really fast UI transformations. The idea is you write a function that says, this is how I draw my UI, and then if my data changes, then I'll go run that function again, and I'll take a look at what the, the difference between the first version and the second version is, do a diff, and then just send those changes to the DOM. As a result, you're almost never touching the DOM. You can batch a lot of changes, and so, um, you know, screen manipulation, that sort of thing gets a lot faster. Well, the uh, closure script libraries, and there are actually several of them that each have their own take on what's the, the nicest way to re work with React. Um, but because closure data is immutable by default, our comparisons are a lot faster because we don't have to do any sort of deep comparison. You know, is the, the third element in the list you know, three levels down different because we just, we have reference equality. If, if, this, if this reference matches this reference, then I know the data matches because it can't change. And so as a result, from what I understand, they get about double the performance uh, using the closure script implementations of React. Uh, well, the wrappers on top of React than React itself gets. Um, and since React's big, one of its big selling points with the performance, that's kind of nice. The other thing I wanted to mention, you know, I said that macros, in practice, as an application developer, you just don't find yourself writing them very often. Um, when I was planning this talk, I was going to say that I had never written a macro in production. Actually, that's not true anymore. I wrote two last week, and so I was really proud about it and was going to talk about it. Um, but then someone else came out with a library that does all the error handling that, that I had built my macros for. So chances are it's not gonna be in production for very long. We'll probably just go with the library. Um, but the cool thing is, is that you know the, the, the macros that, that underlie core async are not anything you or I would wanna write. I mean, they're 500 lines long, they introspect the code, they rewrite themselves as they're rewriting. Um, I think the guy who wrote them, Timothy Baldridge, has a series of, I think it's four hour long YouTube talks explaining how the macro works. I mean, the, start, the first one is called Deep Walking Macros, which just blew my mind and just kind of tells you the, the space, this is, this is how it was done, and then the other ones get into the details. I should probably try rewatching the first one because I, I certainly didn't get it the first time. But what's cool is because he took the time to do that and figure out how to do that, we get the same style of concurrency, not, not, not quite as flexible as what exists in the Go language, but we get to write software, we write, get to write our concurrent code, our asynchronous code, so it looks like Go, but we didn't have to build a language around it. And you know, in C Sharp, when they wanted to go and implement their async await, they had to modify the compiler to support it. In Clojure, it's just a library. You just import it and you have access to it. Um, likewise, there's a, uh, a 
implementation of, uh, it's actually the mini Canron uh, uh, logic programming language. So kind of a prologue style programming where, uh, or relational programming, what they call it, where you specify relationships and it, it basically, you know, solves the, solves the problem. Um, I've seen an example of a prologue, a prologue a uh, Sudoku solver that was four lines of code. I mean, you basically, you specify that each number is unique go going across, went going down in the square, and these are the numbers I know, and just tell me the rest, and it comes back and does it, which sounds like cheating to me, but that's pretty cool. Um, and then, you know, I tried to find other examples of libraries, um, and there's just, there's so many of them, you know, uh, DSLs get written a lot. Um, you know, HTML generation, HTML scraping. Um, we actually, uh, one of the applications I worked on, we had uh, our designers do the pages in HTML and CSS, you know, not any sort of templating language, just, you know, give us HTML with dummy data in it so it looks good. And then we use a library called um, InLive to go and read what's there and do basically CSS style selectors to, to transform. It's like, okay, and this is what it should be programmatically. Um, so I did, I'm running a little bit low on time, but I do want to get to a quick uh, core async demo. And don't worry, I'm not going to live code this one. I, uh, I planned ahead because I can get lost pretty quick. Um, So, um, okay. So basically, I you know um, define a bunch of channels that um, and some functions that use the channels. Um, well, I, I have a, a process uh, called the. Uh, slow doubler that basically is going to, it listens on the, on a input channel and then it sleeps for two seconds. And so here's an example of, uh, give me that, um, you know, of, of calling a, uh, a static method in Java. So thread, thread sleep. So it sleeps for two seconds and then, uh, it writes the output and then it, you know, listens for the next value. And so this is, this is what the, the core async, um, you know, go style programming looks like. Uh, in this case, I use the, the keyword go loop instead of just go, just because it's just going to listen forever. Um, I wrote another function called uh, slow square, which again is just going to listen for a number being passed in. It's going to wait a random amount of time, uh, and then it's going to return a square of the number. So uh, I can do a, a blocking take on uh, this one just calls the doubler. Um, and so it's, you know, it put, on the, the top line, let's see, it's probably easiest to point with this. Um, you know, up here it's saying, okay, write to the input channel for the doubler. And then it's saying, okay, now I'm waiting. And then it, it waited a couple of seconds and printed the result. And in case you missed it, let's do it again. Okay, so now this, this um, the greater than sign with the, the double bang, that's the, the, the two exclamation points means that it's blocking. It's actually, it's taking a thread, it's consuming the thread, you can't do anything with it. And so that's not even available in JavaScript since if you only have one thread, you don't want to, to block it. Um, there's another version, uh, a non-blocking put and a non-blocking take, which, um, will uh, call the, it's just with a single bang, and this has to be called inside a go, a go block. And so you use the, the go keyword, well, the go function to um, define, to, to contain all your channel operations. And so if we call non-blocking, still just calling the doubler, 
it's saying, okay, I'm waiting for the results. And as soon as I called it, it, it before it got to the, the channel operation, it uh, jumped to the end of the go block and printed this. I can keep doing stuff while we wait. And then it says, okay, I got back six. And, you know, so I can have a blocking implementation of uh, square as well. Um, and notice that the, the process is the, the doubler and the square. I mean, these are, you know, long running processes that I'm calling. They don't know that they're blocking or not. They're just, they're listening for messages, doing their stuff and responding to them. It's just in how I use them, whether they're blocking or not. And clearly I did not rename my uh, function when I did my demo. Naming things is hard. So I have this wonderful function called some test that um, is going to show the, you know, one feature that I definitely wanted to show about core async. I mean, other than just the fact that you can communicate uh, with processes and do this yield and return is um, this alts function here. What this does is this calls two different channel operations. Um, so in the go block, I'm writing to the doubler's input, I'm writing to the square's input, and then I call this alts function, and I'm going to wait, and whichever one returns first, then I'm going to say, okay, well, I got the value and the channel I got it from. Um, so if I call some test... We'll do it with three so we can see which it is. It returns a channel, which isn't really helpful, but it's okay. Our number is six, so evidently it was the doubler that we called back, but it tells us that the channel is many-to-many -many channel, which doesn't really tell us anything. Um, now, um, now, the other thing is I just took the... Um, the result off the doubler channel so that the result that the square channel wrote to is still sitting out there waiting to be consumed. Uh, and so I can clear my channel out and it says, okay, you know, I got a value of nine, which was the square, and again tells me the channel. But um, closure, uh, the, the nice thing about closure's maps is the keys can be anything. So again, I'll define a map, and let me do it up near the top of the screen so I can get my names right. Um, so I will define a map um, that's going to have the keys of, I'll just do double out and uh, and uh, square out. So now in my alts, instead of reporting what channel I got it from, what I can do is I can say, okay, look up in M um, the, the channel. And so when I look up based on the key, it should return the string. We will, should is the operative word here. Okay, so once again, the function returns the channel and it says, okay, I got value six from output channel doubler. Um, now I didn't implement the same thing in my clear chance function. So it's still gonna just give us many to many channel. But that, that's one of the nice things. I mean, that's one thing that surprises me time after time is just how useful it is being able to use any data type you want as a key in a map. Uh, and we actually, we did this in a, in a case where we were implementing timers. We had to send a message, wait 30 seconds, and then send another message and could potentially have many messages in flight. And so whenever we send a message, we added the, a timeout pertaining to that message to a map, and then when that timeout returned, we then responded to the, um, you know, we're able to carry on with the, the correct second message. Um, so it looks like we're, we're basically out of time here. It's, uh, you know, the end of the session, I guess. Uh, did anybody have any questions they wanted to talk about? 
Um, oh, I should get back to uh, Keynote and say, oh, I was going to talk about pain points. I do want to run through this really quickly. And um, Closure is dynamically typed, which is really nice, except when it isn't. Uh, it's just, th it's a matter of opinion. Um, it's nice, but I can't tell you how much time personally I spend with type errors. Uh, but there is a, and another good use of macros, there is a uh, typing library called core.typed that provides compile time type checking. It's got a few warts, but it's pretty nice. And then uh, the company Prismatic has a library called Schema that offers runtime type checking and coercion. Um, one thing you're going to find is that setup with Clojure, it's gotten better, but it's still you, it's sometimes difficult to figure out where to start. And basically what you do is you install Java, you install Linegin, which is the build tool, and then you just take the editor of your choice and you're off and running. You can improve on that setup, but that's a good place to start. Um, now, uh, I was going to complain about closure script setup being even more complicated, and uh, you know the REPL requires extra configuration in every project. I finished my slides on Sunday, and then David Nolan broke them on Monday because he pushed out a big new release of closure script, and so. Now it's really easy, so ignore that one. Uh, oh, and closure stack traces suck. This is, this is a very small one because it's just one bad function inside of a Go block. Um, you start layering functions and they just multiply and finding where the actual error occurs is not easy. Um, and there's a Google group, there's star closure on Freenode. I do want to say that you should check out a meetup, particularly if you're in Atlanta, typically the second Tuesday of the month. Um, there are a couple of good books online, you know, for free. Uh, Closure for the Brave and True, Closure from the Ground Up. I know some people have had experience with both of those. I did want to mention um, there's this new book coming out by Karen Meyer called Living Closure, which... I, even though it's for beginners, I'm definitely going to check out because if you've read anything she's written, she's she's a storyteller. I mean, I remember going to a talk she did where she talked about Alice in Wonderland and monads. So it's just uh, it's the the first half of the book is just going to be narratives, telling stories and using examples based on the stories, and then the second half is a a seven week training plan on how to break off small chunks of closure to learn learn about. She said she was inspired by the, uh, have you seen the Couch to 5K program? Where the idea is you start by walking for half an hour a day and then just gradually you add more running. And she's like, well, let me try and do that with programming. And uh, so that looks good. Um, the, uh, the standard reference on, on closure is uh, closure programming. Uh, it's also an O'Reilly book. Um, and so I recommend that. Uh, and then the, the most widely read of the closure books is The Joy of Closure uh, by Michael Fogus and Chris Hauser. It's fantastic, but it's also not the place to start. It really, it gets going quickly, so it's better if you've had experience um, with closure. Uh, I recommend any talk by Rich Hickey. And there's a closure TV channel on YouTube that has most of the talks from the conferences. And, um, you know, you can uh, reach me by email there. Uh, I've got the slides and the demo code up on GitHub. And, um, yeah, so I'm sorry, I ran a bit long. Any questions real quick, or do we want to talk after? Uh, I'll be around. So, I guess, thanks. <laughs>